two easy statements are empowering people with and without disabilities to make their world, or where MacGyver meets assistive technology. And we'll talk about assistive technology in a second. I myself, I'm a programmer and a tinkerer. Um, I teach at the Interactive Telecommunications Program at NYU. And, and I am an occupational therapist with an assistive technology certification. I work at NYU Medical Center. I run the assistive technology clinic there. I'm an adjunct professor at NYU as well in the Department of Occupational Therapy. Um, Holly and I both met at ITP, uh, the Interactive Telecommunications Programs. And uh, I want to give out a shout out to Red Burns, who recently passed mm -hmm. away. But probably Maker Fair wouldn't be what it is without Red in indirectly. Red also did a lot of assistive technology projects even before forming the Interactive tele Telecommunications Program. Um, but yeah, we, we miss her greatly. And she was a big influence on us and mm -hmm. this organization. Yes. So DIY ability is uh, our way of saying we have to get the disability community involved with the making community. It's already happening in the back. Like hospitals are doing it. Uh, occupational therapists make things for their clients. Um, and we see technology as world opening. Uh, if you can use technology, it opens up opportunities that might not be around. Uh, also, we're, we're kind of involved to grow the mindset of including people with disabilities in the maker movement. So we talk about STEM, and we talk about education initiatives. We talk about getting kids involved with education, math, engineering, uh, science, and uh, art, and everything else. But then we also have to think about you know, the people with disabilities have uh, such hard times right now. Unemployment is uh, very hard on them. Uh, mm -hmm. And if we can find a way to get them into those high-tech jobs we're trying to get our kids into, uh, we, can, we can create a much better place for everyone. Uh, and we are stuck as a country. We're just kind of in this weird spot where there's a lot of services, and there's a lot of fighting internally down in DC about who gets what services. And we need a way to just let people be more independent. So yeah. we see uh, the maker movement helping that. So we're kind of following a really distant past. You know, decades ago, there was a company called Abilities that was started in Long Island by a man called Henry Viscardi. And he, there is now a school called the Henry Viscardi School, or the Ability School. Um, and basically, he started a company that do military contracting, and all the employees had a disability. Uh, he himself and his four uh, colleagues started, uh, three other colleagues, basically they said, among the four of them, they had uh, <laughs> three good legs and one good arm. <laughs> and, um, but they grew the company to about 150 people, and they did contracting up until the 60s for wire wrapping, gyroscopes, electronics uh, um, stripping, and all that other stuff for uh, aircraft avionics. So he had a book uh, called Give Us the Tools, which kind of inspired our idea of thinking about making, uh, having people with disabilities make stuff. So here's some, here's some terrible, terribly uh, grainy photos. But these were the workshops at the Abilities Company. And everyone in the workshop that you can see does have a disability of some for maybe they're, uh, you know, they won't be able to use their hands, or they are blind, or um, something is going on. The uh, the top one is kind of their main shop. The bottom left is the um, that is the electronics group, and the bottom right was the wood shop. I think the caption on that photo said they were actually making racks for military bombs. So yeah, the irony of creating more disability. I don't know. <laughs> So what is assistive technology? And I think a lot of people really don't understand exactly what that term means. I do have the, the Assistive Technology Act definition up there. I'm not going to read it word for word. Essentially, assistive technology is the use of a device to help facilitate independence. And that can really be anything. It's a very broad definition. That could be a pair of glasses to help facilitate someone to be able to see, a cane to help somebody to be able to walk, or a computer that's controlled with your eyes to assist somebody with home automation, communication, and computer access. Lots of individuals do benefit um, from assistive technology. That could be anybody with a physical impairment, cognitive impairments, sensory disorders, developmental delays, or even the elderly. And there's three major areas you typically see assistive technology um, affecting in terms of technology use. And the first one would be computer access. The computer is the only thing right now that is commercially available that we all purchase that does have built into it accessibility options. 
Computers can be used by individuals of all abilities if you have the right adaptations and setups. A computer allows an individual to interact and socially, to participate in leisure tasks, communicate, as well as participate in work-related tasks and schooling. And there's lots of different ways a computer can be adapted. It can be adapted with voice activation. It can be adapted through a camera that's looking at the round part of your eye. And as your eye moves, you're typing, you're going onto the internet, you're clicking a mouse. There's different cameras, and we have some pictures up here. This one on the my left right here is a mouse that can be controlled by your head. You have a mouse that can be controlled by your mouse. There's also just different kinds of mice that can be used by your hands, trackball mice, joystick mice. The simple swap out of a different kind of hardware for a mouse can really facilitate the independence for the user. There's also options for keyboard accessibility, changing the software out, having different hardware for keyboard accessibility, again, helping to facilitate that independence and improve the quality of life of the user. Environmental controls is another area that assistive technology can affect, enabling an individual safety in their home, the ability to turn their lights off, control their television, control the air conditioner, anything in the home, as well as dedicated and undedicated devices to help with communication, enabling an individual with impaired speech or no speech at all to communicate to familiar and unfamiliar listeners. Oh, yeah. And now? <laughs> so think about all those assistive assistive technology products and, and add-ons, uh, the computer is just a great equalizer. It kind of brings everyone up to the same level to some point. Uh, and you look at iPads, which are kind of one of the products that really you can, a blind user could take it out of the store, open it out of the box, and pretty much use it themselves without asking for assistance from anyone else. Uh, there's really never been a piece of hardware like that before. Uh, the Makey Makey, of course, custom switches for uh, different interfaces. Um, and all these off-the-shelf products. And then when you think about what you can use the computer for now and what we use the computer for here, you have robots, home automation with the Belkin uh, autom uh, wireless uh, uh, DC plug, AC-DC plug, drones, CNC machines, maker bots, laser cutters. These are all controlled by computers. So the idea, if we think about people with disabilities being able to control the computer, they can control these devices that we all just use to make things anyway. And so that brings us to what is the accessible makerspace and who's there, what's its function, what's it look like. The way we see the accessible makerspace is it's not that different from the current makerspace setup as it is today. It's just more inclusive. Uh, it has the right options and features for everyone to kind of be able to use the tools and the setup. Um, and also thinking not just about makers, or people that call themselves makers, but thinking about outside family members, friends, uh, and healthcare providers can also kind of come in, use the facility, and kind of make the adaptations they need, which they probably are already doing at right. their clinics, maybe in the hospital. So you, you might have heard barrier-free design. Barrier-free design is basically you know, the ramps going into a building that has steps or a lift. Um, big open spaces for people who are using wheelchairs to be able to maneuver around, workbenches and tools that can be reconfigured, height adjustable, so people that might have to uh, have a higher, uh, might have a taller wheelchair fit underneath the table, be at everyone else's level, so they're not kind of sitting back away from the table. And then also things considering like sound and light quality. Uh, mm -hmm. Are the lights annoying? So if you think of a lot of, a lot of uh, people with autism, might also be sensitive to different types of light, sound quality. You might want to have a workshop that is a low noise event um, or maybe a high noise event, depending on. The functions of the, the, the place should really just be, you know, the same as every other makerspace. Just learn and encourage people to make stuff, uh, but not focus on, like, accessibility and assistive technology directly, but just kind of make it part of it, bring it into it, but not make it the sole focus of it. Because then it becomes something yeah. else. It becomes like a university research center, and it's just sorely focused. You want to teach people to think outside of the box, too, when they're looking at this technology and alternatives to how it can be accessed and used. Right. So if you have a makerspace already, or you have a, a workshop that you kind of have and you, you bring people over, you know, the, the main thing is you kind of accessify it first 
And maybe this is on a per guest basis that people coming in, you kind of work with them to kind of get the right access uh, so they can kind of get started in making with you guys. You don't have to do everything at once. That's kind of impossible. Universal design is a wonderful theory, but and, and just impossible. Uh, but as people come in and need certain things, you can definitely accommodate. You know, wooden ramps are not that hard to make. Um, and once you get those amenities set up, you can collaborate with local disability organizations, schools, bring them in, have little workshops with either the teachers or the, the therapists that are working there, and kind of get those different minds together. And then you make your own tools and jigs, as I mentioned before. Uh, one of the big things about the abilities company in Long Island, there was one guy that just went around, and he was really good at figuring out, OK, this employee doesn't have hands, but he needs to do wire wrapping. All right, so that was his job to figure out the jig that that employee was going to use to do the wire wrapping. So you do have to have that, like, OK, what are the tools that we need to make this happen? And at the same time, those jigs that you make might be great community building assignments for the space together um, to just kind of figure out. Oh, and then share everything. Don't, don't hold on to it. Um, so we're inspired by a lot of people. We have a few of our favorites here. Adaptive Design is actually our host in Midtown Manhattan. Um, they've been doing adaptive design with cardboard carpentry, making adapted chairs for kids with disabilities for the last 10 years to 12 years. Um, little Devices, uh, they're actually over near the uh, Maker Shed outside. They have a Maker Nurse spot and Little Devices that's a group at MIT. Uh, Meryl Epler uh, is a friend in USC. She actually coined the term Makers with Mixed Abilities, which I love a lot. Uh, Young Hun Chung was a former student of mine, and he uh, is now at the University of Pittsburgh adapting Lego Mindstorms to uh, the Toby device and the Dynavox, which yeah. is a communication and an access device for uh, uh, kids and teens and young adults. And Amy Hurst and Sean Kane. Sean? There's Sean. <laughs> Sean uh, and Amy run the, the pad down at the UMBC, and they do a lot of assistive technology design. They get their students making things, everything from 3D printing to uh, virtual, tangible uh, interfaces. Uh, Sean's great. Um, our current status of DIY ability, uh, we have a space, which is really great. It's already accessible because the space, uh, the, the organization there was already uh, up to code. Uh, we've been doing teens, uh, teen events for uh, teens with physical disabilities, making and fabrication and coding. And we've been doing toy hacking events um, for basically anyone, kind of come in, kind of figure out the basics of adapting. And we are also certified by the American Occupational Therapy Association so that when occupational therapists take our classes, they do receive continuing ed credits as well. <laughs> so a few photos. Uh, with uh, the support of Cognizant and the Making the Future grant, Cognizant is running the Youth Pavilion just over there. Um, we uh, got a grant to set up some workshops, basically, uh, we did programming, we did electronics, and we did digital fabrication. Here's a photo of uh, Matthew. I don't know if Matthew is still here. They were rolling around before. Um, Matthew uh, is a young man. He has cerebral palsy. Uh, the first time I met him, he had a laptop in one hand and an iPad in the other. And he wouldn't pop me until he got the Wi-Fi password. So he came to the event, and he wanted to design an iPad holder. So we used the Vetric Pro software from ShopPot, and uh, we made the specs it was like the tightest fitting iPad holder ever. It was like a tenth of an inch uh, tightness. Um, and he, he's, uh, in the photo on the left, he's controlling the machine that actually loaded the, uh, uh, the file into it to control the CNC. And then the final product. So the great thing about these things, going back, is that Matthew could use a computer, so why can't he be a maker? Mm -hmm. um, and he, he uses the mouse, and he, but he prefers the trackpad, as you can see. Um, uh, yeah, and so the final product was this basically uh, balsa wood kind of iPad uh, holder, and uh, we broke a bit. We had a lot of rites of passage doing this, but it was good. You want to talk about yeah, toys? This, I mean, this is a, a picture from one of our toy hacking events, and you know, one thing that we like to do is we run events again to teach people how to think outside of the box, so we teach people how to hack toys to alternative um, switch ports on there, so if you are an individual, a child with a disability where you couldn't access the conventional switch that came with the toy, we show you how show the individual how they can adapt it. We could put any ability switch on it so that the user could then control the toy with their foot, their head, their 
elbow, whatever their, whatever their strongest um, area of movement is so they can still play with that toy. Again, these are more pictures from a toy hacking event. Yeah, we have we have had a pretty good run. We have an event yeah. in the holidays called the Hacking for the Holidays, and the the basic idea is we bring people in and they get little little parts. They all bring a toy with them, and then we show them how to open it up and uh, make it uh, accessible. Uh, this was at yeah. EdCamp Steam. I don't know if anyone went to the EdCamp Steam in Jersey this past summer. Uh, basically, this these are not occupational therapists or people that have uh, uh, family members with disabilities. These were just two teachers that got their dancing bears to finally work by making aluminum foil gloves and high-fiving each yeah. other, and then that was the switch to make right. them work. Um, and you can see, you, you don't even need soldering irons, you could just use alligator clips and foil to make this happen. Um, so I think about makerspaces, uh, there's this wonderful quote from the poem, Lord Byron's poem, how little do we know that which we are, how less what we may be. And if you think about going into a space that allows you to just tinker and stuff, fail, make, fail, make. Um, when you start to discover what you are and what you really enjoy, I feel that's what makerspaces are all about, to kind of keep going for that. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, Do you have any questions? Yeah, thank you so much for coming. We will be around uh, over there. <laughs>